Runtime Verification is a technology company with focus on proof generation and verification. Its core technology, the K framework, enables general purpose, versatile tools and solutions for secure, scalable, and efficient products and infrastructures. We are likely known as one of the major blockchain security auditing companies with emphasis on formal specification and verification of protocols and smart contracts. The first who formalized the ERC-20 token standard, the first who formally verified or even audited Uniswap, the first who formalized and verified Ethereum's proof of stake protocol and the Ethereum 2 deposit contract. This, among many others. However, if you think of us as the best security auditors who use their own formal verification technology, okay, which many say is the best programming language semantics framework, invented and perfected by ourselves, then, well, you would be correct, but you would not think big enough. We are way more than that. Security auditing and formal verification are only a fraction of what we are. We are here to revolutionize the very concept of trust in machines, trust in computers, trust in programs, trust in blockchains, both in terms of what trust means and how to achieve it. This goes way beyond just formal verification. As you'll see, I am Grigore Roshu, the founder of Runtime Verification and the inventor of the K framework. I made this presentation in early 2023 to remind our existing team why we are all here, but also, importantly, to explain what we do and what we aim at to our potential new employees and investors who may have not got a chance to dive deep into our technology and research. What I present here is the result of more than 20 years of persistent work, which has been repeatedly validated peer-reviewed publications in top scientific avenues. You can find all the relevant publications as well as detailed explanations and videos on our RV Research webpage, research.runtimeverification.com. Here, I keep things high level for brevity. Let me start with what we mean by the universal truth framework, what, what it is. Well, it is a framework in which every claim that is made by this framework is verifiably true. In other words, claims come with independent, succinct, third-party checkable proof certificates. Okay, so what is a claim? A claim in this framework is anything that is provable or computable. In particular, the execution of a program a particular work that has been done or an action that has been performed, the formal correctness or security of some code or any mathematical theorem. And indeed, in our framework that we present, all the above can be formalized as mathematical theorems, okay? So let's look to the picture to the right. So any claim phi is going to have a proof phi phi, which is 16, very small, and can be checked instantaneously. Okay, so then we know, or anybody else, any third party can check the proof phi phi, and they will know immediately that phi is true. Okay, and they can do that with a verifier that can check the proof of phi instantaneously. So you instantaneously know, thanks to this framework, universal truth framework, that phi is true as far as you can check phi phi. 
Now you may wonder, and what? Well, this would have many, many, many applications. Sky is the limit. For example, verifiable computing, as we know it, would now work for all programming languages. So basically, you can execute your code securely in untrusted environments, for example, in the cloud. And you would get back a certificate, you check it, and you know your computation was correct. Or, for example, you can have ZK variants of languages or any languages correct by construction. Okay? You can have, for example, all the ZK EVM variants or Cairo or ZK EVM of risk zero or ZK LLVM of the NIL Foundation. All of these simply because what these do are a special instance of the previous slide I showed. You execute a program, get a correctness certificate. But the program execution is just a claim in our universal tool framework, no more, no less. Also, formal verification, correctness, security audits, any other program claims, all these become checkable certificates instead of silly PDFs, as it's happening these days. So you don't have to trust the developers of the smart contracts or the auditors of those smart contracts or anybody else. You simply check the correctness certificates. Also, we can go beyond blockchain. For example, critical procedures or devices, like medical devices, in aviation, in automotive industry, robotics, blockchains. All of these yield checkable certificates for their correct application. This will increase our confidence in complex systems, in complex processes, in machines, in AI, after all. So AI, or all these machines, they will perform the action or they will search for a solution to the action, then they will present to us a proof that we can check. And now we know that whatever they claimed is correct. How are we going to achieve this amazing framework, truth framework? The essence of our idea is to combine K with SNARKs. And we found that they combine beautifully. Let me tell you the idea. So you start with the claim file. And you pass it, generically speaking, to the K framework. Think of the K framework as a searcher in a huge space of possibilities for a mathematical proof of your claim. Okay, your claim can be that this protocol is correct. Your claim can be that this program execution is correct. Your claim can be anything that can be formally stated. And the K framework with its suite of tools will search for a mathematical proof for your claim. And here K can reuse really many other tools as helpers. For example, K has backends for Quark, for Lean, for Didacti. Now, you can use all of these. They all help you to search for a mathematical proof for your claim. You can even use AI, like ChatGPT. Some of our folks at RV actually started playing with ChatGPT to find lemmas, helping lemmas to prove their theorems. So truly, you can think of K in this picture as a mighty <laughs> searcher for a mathematical rigorous proof of your claim. All right. The problem with mathematically rigorous proofs is that they are very long in real life. If we want to go down all the way to the axioms of mathematics and the basic proof reasoning, then mathematical proofs are going to be very, very long. Here, I only show like uh, 99, 999 steps in a proof where we use some axioms and some uh, proof rules, like modus ponens, step 248, for example. Right, so this proof, think of this proof as, as, as taking like a lot of space, like gigabytes or terabytes of space. They are huge. They are the ultimate correctness certificate for your claim, because it's a mathematical proof to the last detail, but they are huge. Okay, now the problem is how to reduce this huge size, right? Because we want to ship them. We want, remember this, we want these certificates, the, the, the correctness certificates to be very small because we want to ship them around. So they should be small. 
and easy to check. Well, here is the trick. The trick that, that we are very proud of. Okay? So instead of shipping this huge mathematical proof, instead, check the proof with a proof checker. Okay, so the, the advantage of having a very, very detailed mathematical proof is that you can check it with a very simple-minded, even dumb, proof checker. Okay, so the proof checker will check every single step in each huge, 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 huge proof. And by the way, this can, K and, and the checker, they can be piped, right? So you don't even need to generate and store the entire proof. I mean, you generate it, but you check it as you generate it, as opposed to storing it. Because even storing such a huge proof can be, can be um, <laughs> no, unbelievably uh, hard. All right. Now, we implemented a proof checker for the logic underlying the K framework. And that proof checker is disarmingly small. It has only 240 lines of code. I'll get back to this later. So in only 240 lines of code, you can check any claim made by any program in any programming language. This is huge, huge. Okay, so now, next, what we are going to do is to snark this proof checker. Okay, so it will produce a cryptographic certificate, a cryptographic proof that a mathematical proof for the public claim phi has been checked, has been presented to it and checked and passed. Okay, so first K, then proof checker, snark proof checker, which is super small. And notice that now you don't have to trust K at all. You only have to trust these 240 lines of proof checker, which is not. The applications of the universal truth framework that I mentioned a couple of slides ago are kind of obvious, natural. <laughs> Once you understand how this combination of K and SNARKs works, it will be pretty clear that you can have ZK lang for any programming language, lang, or you have a formal semantic. It will be pretty clear that you can generate from formal security audits for necessary proof certificate. Um, but let me tell you an application which goes way beyond what is possible these days. So let's first understand the, some of the current limitations of blockchains. Okay, so first, duplication of computation, right? So all the validators note, they re-execute the programs. All nodes execute the same code. That's a waste. All of them come with hardwired programming languages or virtual machine languages like EVM or RISC-V or um, AIRO so, or, or um, Move VM. So all of these come with a predefined language for all programs running on that blockchain. Why? <laughs> then also the security or correctness or formal verification arguments why a certain program on the blockchain is correct. These are external activities. They are done off chain and their documents, like the security audits, PDF files, are stored off chain. Why? Universal Truth Framework will enable a new generation of blockchains. We like to call it the blockchain of truth. Why? Because we can have now a blockchain which allows arbitrary claims to be made, stored and checked, like executions or correctness or any truth. We can write smart contracts in any programming or specification language for which you have a formal semantics. We can execute any code, any transaction code, once and for all, locally only. And then we send the SNARK certificate to the validators and they check it. Every single claim made this way is backed by a mathematical proof 
that is made using the key framework, which is then made succinct as a cryptographic proof using SNAR technology and checked by the proof checker of matching logic. In some sense, it is like a proof of proof, cryptographic proof of a mathematical proof of the claim. Indeed, I believe that the blockchains of the future will have no virtual machines, no virtual machines run by validators. These are very complicated implementations. Many of them, most of them, all of them, with bugs in them. Why take that risk? Moreover, that complicates the blockchain network, complicates infrastructure. Nodes, validators need significant resources to run, to re-execute all the transactions. I believe the blockchains of the future will have no VMs. They'll have a very light consensus protocol. And all the validators' nodes will just check proof certificates. And that's it. And you can write your transactions, your smart contracts in any language you want, even by hand. <laughs> If you can pro you produce the if you can produce the proof certificate by hand, then you are welcome to write the contract even by hand. But most likely this will be produced by programs. Yeah, so now that I believe I got your attention, let me tell you a few words about K. What is K? What is K and why we have it? Let me set the scene first. We tell computers what to do using programming languages. There are many languages already, and many of them are invented as we speak, especially in new domains that propose novel means of computation, like the blockchain. Unless, unless it is very new, each language usually comes with a suite of tools interpreters and compilers are the most basic tools because they allow us to execute programs to implement virtual machines and importantly to test programs before deployment. For example, factorial of three evaluates to six equals six. In applications where program correctness is paramount, like in mission or safety or security critical systems, Conventional testing is not sufficient. We need deeper program analysis. Broadly speaking, model checkers systematically analyze the space of behaviors of a program up to specified boundaries or abstractions. They allow us to find corner cases, which can be bugs or optimal solutions to specified constraints. For example, the maximum extracted value of a set of transactions is 17 or some number. Formal verification tools give us the highest level of assurance because they cover all the behaviors of a given program. You can think of them as exhaustive testing tools. To cover potentially very large or even infinite Spaces of program behaviors or states. Formal verifiers may make use of symbolic execution and logical deductive reasoning uh, to mathematically prove that programs satisfy their requirements. For example, that the smart contract at this address is a correct implementation of the ERC 1020 token specification. Basically, each error in this picture. represents a certain tool, a whole system, actually, for a certain language, which usually is quite complex, sometimes taking many, many, many years of work. For example, get is an interpreter, this arrow from Ethereum to the interpreter. So get is an interpreter for EVM. GCC is a compiler for C, this arrow. Java Pathfinder is a model checker for Java. Sertora is a deductive verifier for EVM, and so on and so forth. Some tools aim at implementing two or more of the above capabilities. For example, our KEVM 
system provides all the above tools for EVM, but more about that shortly. In short, we have lots of languages and lots of tools for that, which are using critical infrastructure, applications, and products. The current state of affairs comes with major pain points, both for developers and for users. That is, for all of us. For developers, duplication of code and work is always a pain. Indeed, different tools for the same language require a parser or a control flow graph extractor. And each of these implement their own, usually by copying and adapting an existing code base. Worse, the same conceptual tool for two different languages, for example, model checkers for C and for Java, are perceived and implemented as two completely different tools, although they conceptually implement the same well understood algorithm or technique adapted to a different language. This is a waste of time, talent, and effort. And let's not forget that programming languages evolve as well from version one to version two to version 17, like C11, C17. So more often than not, these tools are versions behind. While developers' pain may seem serious enough, in fact, it pales in comparison with its consequences for the rest of us, the users of these tools. For example, why should we trust that a program executed correctly for example, the factorial of three correctly evaluated to six in some given implementation of C or Java or Solid. After all, there are hundreds of thousands of lines of code implementing the compilers and interpreters of these languages. The situation is even worse for tools meant to ensure correctness, such as model checkers or deductive verifiers. Why should we trust the tool that claims that the contract of that address, F5, correctly implements an ERC-20 token specification. All the tools for all the languages in the end make claims that we are forced to accept, like claims of execution, claims of optimality, claims of correctness. We take risks on a daily basis, trusting all these claims, risks that sometimes result in loss of human life or of expensive machinery, or of money. Is there any alternative, though? Would it be possible to have a universal framework where any claim made by any tool or any programming language can be independently checked with a unique universal claim checker? Ideally, one which is so simple that it can be implemented in a matter of hours if one does not want to trust existing implementation? Yes, it is. We invented it 20 years ago, the K framework, and, protect, and per, perfected it ever since. And now it is ready, finally. And now we are on a mission to make it a reality, to disrupt the state of the art, and to change the way we think about computing and trust. The K framework, is our solution to address the two pain points discussed on the previous slide. On the developer side, K allows and provides a programming language for languages, a domain-specific language to implement programming languages or to define programming languages. We call these programming language definitions formal semantics of the respective languages. On the other hand, the various tools that the K framework provides, like interpreters, model checkers, symbolic execution engines, deductive verifiers, all these are implemented in a generic way, in a language agnostic way. In other words, you define a language, plug it in the K framework, and then pick a tool for that language, let's say symbolic execution, and you got a symbolic execution engine for your language. This separation of concerns has major implications in terms of increasing network effect, because you implement a language once 
and for all, or define a language once and for all, and then you get all the tools for that language. You improve the language, go from Java 4 to Java 1.5, and now you got all the tools already upgraded automatically for your new version of the language. And also, similarly, you are very motivated now to fix bugs or add optimizations, improvements to tools for the various languages. For example, if you make the symbolic ejection engine faster in K, then you get a faster symbolic ejection engine for all languages, for all of these languages. Um, but importantly, you don't have to maintain n times m different systems where n is the number of languages and m is the number of tools. Instead, you only have to maintain the languages themselves, n, plus the tools themselves, m. So n plus m instead of n times m. So this reduces enormously the complexity and makes tool development uh, more convenient. So that's how K addresses the, um, the pain point for developers. For users, on the other hand, everything that the blue boxes do in K, everything that K does, basically, is a proof of a theorem where the language is a theory in which the claim that we make, for example, any of these uh, claims to the right, the claim is a theorem. And then the blue box produces a mathematical proof or searches for a mathematical proof for that claim. And I want to emphasize, and this is very important for our thesis in this presentation, that computation is a particular case of proof. When you execute a program with the interpreter tool of K, you get a mathematical proof step by step, starting from the axioms of the programming language that your program does what it's supposed to do. For example, factorial of three equals six. And we have a proof checker, which has two, a very small proof checker, 240 lines of code, which can check any of these proofs done by any of those blue boxes um, of K or anything else, any other tool that can produce mathematical proofs. So those proofs can be checked using the proof checker. So that's the idea of the K framework. And some of these um, results, particularly the proof checker and, uh, and uh, how to um, generate proofs from computations are recent results. They have been published um, one or two years ago, for example, in CAV uh, 21, in UPSA 23. But the K framework itself was proposed, the name K was proposed for the first time in, 20, in 2003, so 20 years ago. The very first ideas of K, so came um, in 2001 when I was a research scientist at NASA where we actually faced the same problems as, as we do now. <laughs> Not much uh, changed uh, in the field since then uh, in terms of um, pain points for developers and for users. Considering how much it does, it is not surprising that the K framework is very large and very complex. It has more than 500,000 lines of code in four different languages. <laughs> And it is likely the most complex formal method system. And it's all open source, by the way, the kframework.org uh, website. This diagram here shows the architecture of the, of the tools and dependencies that uh, we use in our internal development. Uh, the details are not important, so don't try to look at the details. But what's important here is that the system is very large and very complex. So why, why would you trust it? Actually, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, because K can produce mathematical proofs of everything it does, and you can check those proofs instead. That is the entire philosophy of our approach. You don't need to trust complexity. You simply check it, check the proof certificates, correctness. So to summarize the discussion so far, the K framework, 
allows you to define a programming language to its formal semantics once and for all, and then plug it in the framework and play it, meaning that you can derive all the tools that you need for your language from the formal semantics of the programming language. And all these tools are capable of producing mathematical proofs of everything they do. And everything they do is a mathematical theorem. Well, in reality, this instrumentation of the tools to produce mathematical proof objects is a new development. Um, not all the tools have been instrumented to work with all the languages. There's still engineering work needed in progress. Um, but we'll get there. And when we get there, everything K does will result in a proof object that can be checked by a proof object, which I'm going to talk about later. But next, I'm going to talk a bit about what's new in K, what happened in the last one year and a half or so. There are many new recent developments in K, which I cannot mention uh, in this presentation. I'm only going to focus on a few of them. One of the most important recent developments is the case summarizer. The case summarizer is super cool. <laughs> it basically generates a control flow graph of all the behaviors of a given program. Okay, so that's very similar to what a compiler does, except that it does it completely driven by the semantics and completely automatically and correct by construction. Okay. So let me illustrate this with an example. So let's consider the semantics of EVM in K, KEVM, and the following code fragment in Solidity, some contract that calculates the sum of numbers from one to N. This is only for uh, illustrative purposes, not meant to be practical. So the program takes an input N, then assigns the sum S, uh, which is the return va uh, value of the contract as well, to one, and then goes through the, uh, this loop and adds all the numbers in some optimal way, in the sense that uh, it only adds the numbers larger than uh, than two because it starts with one. Well, as a matter of fact, this program <laughs> must be called with n larger than or equal to one in order to output the correct uh, the, the expected sum. Right? If n equals zero, this returns one, which is incorrect. It should return zero if n equals zero. But for anything n larger than or equal to one, it should work, it works correctly. Right, so what the case summarizer does, takes a programming language semantics as input, the AVM semantics, and then this program, which we compile first, get the EVM code, and then from that, from these two inputs, the programming language semantics, and this program, it generates a graph, like this one to the right. Notice that this graph looks very much like the program um, in the sense there is some code that initializes things, the s equals one and i equals n before the loop. Then the loop takes place and then there is the exit from the program. Okay? But what's different here from normal compilers is that every single edge in this control flow graph is actually a theorem, a reachability claim, saying that if you are in a state that matches the first uh, property, the first uh, pattern, the source pattern of the arrow, then if the conditions on the arrow hold, notice that sometimes there are multiple arrows from a node, so there are conditions splitting the, the potential uh, behaviors. If the conditions hold, then you reach a state that matches the target pattern. In other words, this <coughs> case summarizes, sum summarizer, summarizes all the behaviors of the program, okay, completely automatically, driven by the programming language semantics and the program only. And this is at the core of several of our other tools, like efficient interpreters, compilers, program verifiers, model checkers, because once you summarize the program, you can do everything you want to do with the program with the summary of the program, but much more efficiently because the summarizer already summarized all the basic blocks of the program. Okay, so all the instructions in the basic block have been semantically summarized 
into such arrows here. You can think of these arrows like big steps, like comprising all the steps in the, in the, in the block. So this was not possible six months ago. <coughs> and um, because it is correct by construction, uh, we can generate uh, proofs actually from what happens here. And this allows us to, um, to generate proof objects eventually from everything that, uh, that our tools do. So we regard this as a game changer. Um, and even in the scientific academic community, generating compilers correct by construction from programming language semantics is the holy grail. Uh, I'm not saying that we are there yet for all the languages, but we are very close at this point. Another important new development in the K framework is the integration with Foundry. Uh, essentially, giving access to the EVM semantics in K uh, by means of cheat codes in Foundry. Uh, so what is Foundry? Foundry is uh, an increasingly popular um, parametric property testing framework for Solidity. It's like JUnit for, for Java, but uh, for Solidity. And um, usually the parametric property testing frameworks uh, work by having some setup um, uh, code that allow you to initialize the state and then a set of tests or property tests that uh, that exercise uh, various behaviors um, against that uh, that state. So here we have one uh, setup that um, that um, instantiates the sum contract we saw on the previous slide, and then we have only one property that uh, basically checks the the sum. Right, so it the, the it it takes an input n and then a capital n and assumes you have uh, so these are the cheat codes um, like assume and uh, and and others so uh, so you assume um, a precondition for uh, for for the code that you want to test and uh, this is symbolic so this n is not uh, fixed is uh, is um, is an arbitrary parameter. And then you run your code and then you assert some properties of the state that you obtain after you execute the test. And the way Foundry works um, uh, by default is to generate uh, random inputs for these parameters uh, and then to run all the concrete, the resulting concrete uh, tests. So by instantiating these parameters, these parametric properties become unit tests that then are checked against uh, the state. So um, this is fast, but it potentially covers uh, only a subset of the of the inputs. Okay, so like in our example, remember that our code was incorrect when n equals zero. So you may expect Foundry to find a counterexample here that uh, n when n is zero, which uh, is accepted by our precondition, then um, the assertion would would uh, would fail. Right? But unfortunately, uh, the fuzzer the of Foundry cannot find this error because the input space is infinite and it just that doesn't uh, guess, doesn't uh, randomly choose n equals zero to find the problem. However, if you uh, bound the input to a certain range, so if you also assume n smaller than 10, then you only have 10 uh, values to check and Foundry will exhaustively or all the input and then it will find the problem. Um, so what what can so this is this is a tool that uh, Solidity developers use um, regularly these uh, these days. Many of our clients uh, at runtime verification are already familiar with Foundry. If not, we teach them uh, because we believe Foundry is the best uh, testing framework for uh, for Solidity code. So what K Foundry does, it takes essentially exactly the same input to the tool. So exactly the same. Uh, property specifications with exactly the same assumptions and the same assertions. And instead of fuzzy testing, it does symbolic execution. So instead of instantiating these parameters, and uh, in this case with uh, concrete values, it leaves them symbolic and then executes the code using the EVM semantics under the hood. Okay, so this way the parametric tests actually become formal specifications. And the K Foundry tool actually formally verifies them. All right, so this is a nice way to expose the power of the K framework to developers 
without requiring them to learn K. Actually, the learning curve of K foundry is essentially zero uh, once you already know foundry. So it's the, the, the same familiar user interface that foundry offers and K is completely hidden under the hood. And I would like to make a theoretical argument here, namely that parametric tests are actually very powerful in terms of program verification. So unexperienced uh, users or formal verification users may think that formal verification is more powerful than parametric tests because uh, with formal verification you can prove properties, but with parametric tests you can only test properties. Well, it turns out that hot triples, which really are the core of formal verification, that's how we express properties, actually can be captured completely and correctly by parametric properties. And I would like to explain that because I think understanding this is um, important to uh, understanding why the integration of K with a tool like Foundry is so important. Right, so in, in program verification, core triples or correctness uh, triples are of the form precondition, code, postcondition. And these three entities, preconditions, code, and postconditions, they share some free variables. So I just mentioned them here for all VARs. These are the free variables that occur in the precondition and code and the postcondition. As an example, in our uh, previous um, property of natural of, of the sum of natural numbers. Actually, the the, the whole triple or the correctness triple would look like this. The precondition should be <laughs> n larger than zero. Remember, for n equals zero, the code is incorrect. N larger than zero, then the code is this. The result is sum of n, and notice the same n capital n is used in the precondition and the code, and also in the postcondition, which states that the result should be the closed. Um, form solution. And also n appears in the post condition. The same n appears in all of these. So we say that n is a free variable or a parameter of the um, of the or triple. All right, then the same or triple, which again is at the core of formal verification. So any formal verification tool for um, conventional tool for uh, for uh, solidity would work uh, or would the correctness of the tool would be explained in terms of such whole triples? Well, so such whole triples can be ex expressed as property tests just as well, right? So it's a property test with the, with the variables, the, the free variables as parameters. Then we assume the precondition, execute the code, assert the postcondition. Or in our uh, case, we write this property and this time we write it correctly. So assume n larger than zero strictly, not larger than or equal to zero. Then we call the code and we assert the property at the end. Okay. And now if we take exactly this property test written correctly here and pass it to K Foundry, K Foundry would prove it. Of course, Foundry cannot prove it because Foundry only test generates and we have an infinite space of inputs here. Foundry only generates as many as we are, you know, <laughs> willing to wait for. And then some it will uh, you will have to stop it, but uh, K foundry will terminate here with a correct proof of this uh, result. Anyway, the point I want to make here is that parametric properties are very powerful. They are almost equivalent to formal verification um, because most of formal verification is in fact symbolic property testing. You can always express more complex properties um, that are harder to express using symbolic property testing or because uh, we may need to extend uh, the property specification language with temporal logics and so on. However, we know that we have K at our disposal. So at any given moment, we can specify the harder to specify properties directly in K. So we still have as um, an exit strategy, the full K to write properties that cannot be written in front ends, but we found K found it to be a very, practical front end to the K, semant K EVM semantics. And uh, we are in the process of, uh, of developing similar tools for other languages, for other blockchains, other ecosystems like uh, Rust uh, or um, uh, Algorand, uh, this Algo Clarity language, and so on. Um, the, the point is that it is very easy 
well, not very easy. Engineering work is still required, but it's relatively easy to develop such uh, tools for, um, for a language on top of the case semantics of the language. Okay? And uh, we demonstrated with Cave Foundry, and we'll do the same for other blockchains. Another new development is the ERCX tool. So this is an ERC compliance checker for um, token implementations. Essentially, it's like in Cave Foundry when you write property tests. However, in this case, the property tests are known because the ERC20, for example, token has a well-known specification where well, there are lots of variations and we took all of this into account in the RCX tool. But the idea is that the specifications are already hardwired in this front end. And all you have to do is to provide an address, a blockchain address containing the code. And this tool will automatically check and give you a report of compliance for that token. So go to ERCX, runtimeverification.com, type your address down here, submit your code, and see how you step up. Important to keep in mind is that this tool is completely automatic. As a user, you don't have to provide specifications, you don't have to provide invariants, you don't have to provide lemmas, you don't have to provide anything. Just type your address, and this tool will check compliance automatically for you. And we intend to develop more and more tools of this kind on top of the of our uh, language semantics. Well, because we can, because this is what the K framework has been designed for. We define the semantics of a programming language once, and then all the tools that uh, that uh, uh, make use of that semantics are defined on top of it. The tools I showed so far were instantiating the K framework with the EVM or Solidity semantics. But the K framework is generic. We can instantiate it with any programming language. RVMatch is one of the tools in our uh, company where the K framework is instantiated with the C programming language. It is one of the oldest tools in runtime verification. However, there are some new developments and improvements to RVMatch. Specifically in the context of verifying the fire denser Solana validator. Uh, this is a project in collaboration with John. So RV Match, same like Foundry, like K Foundry, tries to minimize the learning curve for users. Essentially, you run your tests in C the same way you run them normally. However, instead of using GCC or Clang or whatever compiler you use, you replace that compiler with the RVMatch corresponding tool, which is KCC. So we try to reduce the learning curve, even of the name. So instead of GCC, you type KCC. So this is how it works uh, on a code snippet from the Fire, fire Dancer. So this code, this function does something complicated, but efficiently. And if you compile it, and run it with GCC, so compile GCC, run it, the code runs just fine. However, if you replace GCC with KCC, so you compile with KCC exactly the same parameters, the same um, command line, and then you run the resulting binary, you get an error. In this case, an undefined behavior of some sort, and you get exact precise pointers to the C standard specification explaining this kind of undefined behavior. So basically, undefined behavior means that this program can behave completely differently on another platform. If you compile the program and run it on a different platform, you may behave completely differently. And that's important in the case of validators because you want the validators to run their validation code on different platforms, um, even FPGAs and so on. So it's very important to make sure that C Validators implemented in C are free of undefined behaviors. So this is the RVMatch tool, and um, it is based on the formal semantics of C. It's the most comprehensive C uh, semantics so far, and it is ISO compliant. So basically, if you run your C programs with the RVMatch tool, you know that your programs do not have undefined behaviors. That is the um, promise of the tool. 
I certainly didn't make justice to all the new developments in the game framework in the last one year and a half. For example, I didn't say anything about the semantics of Tezos Mikkelson, K, K Mikkelson, or uh, Algorand Virtual Machine uh, semantics, K, A, V, M, or the semantics of Plutus, Cardanus Plutus, or K Plutus in K, which basically enabled tools like the ones we saw previously for all these new blockchains. But what I really wanted to illustrate with the previous few examples is that first, Kelly matured enough to be used as the core infrastructure of very practical tools for the respective languages defining K. And second, that K, with all its complexity and power, can be hidden under the hood by such tools that have a user-friendly interface. In other words, you have the full power of K at your service, but at the same time, you don't need to access that complexity unless you really, really want to and you know what you are doing. And with this, we are ready to move to the next um, section of my uh, presentation, where we talk about why should you trust K? Everything K does for a particular programming language is a proof of a theorem in the mathematical theory corresponding to that programming language. And we want to snark this proof arguments. In order to do that, we need to first understand how we can generate large proof objects that then need to be not. In order to understand proof objects, we need to understand the logic underlying everything K does, which is matching logic. Matching logic is the foundation of K, but not only. It can also very well, and it does, serve as a foundation of languages like Coq, Lean, and other uh, interactive theorem provers. It is the smallest logical foundation known for languages and formal verification that has this is expressiveness. It was invented in 2019, and it is so small that you can write it on a napkin. I put it on the right here. This is the entire logic. So it has seven syntactic constructs and 15 proof rules. And with these proof rules, and these are mathematical, logical proof rules, not the cryptographic proof rules. Those are a different beast. So mathematical proof rules are of this form, where you either have a fact or you have an inference rule where from some hypothesis, you derive a conclusion, like the modus ponens, for example, proof rule. So with these proof rules, you can derive, starting with axioms, any theorem of interest. And that is correct by construction as far as you have a proof for it, because you construct the theorem using the proof system. So again, this very small proof system allows you to define any programming language. Why? Because we have a translation from K to matching logic. So definitions, K definitions, semantic definitions can be translated to matching logic theories and tasks proved with K become theorems in matching logic. In other words, this simple, small logic that you can write on a napkin can define any programming language and can express any claim about any program in said programming language. It's a very powerful and expressive logic. In fact, everything that not only K, but also Coq, Lean, or other interactive theorem provers based on complex uh, type systems. All this can also be framed 
as matching logic, as provable matching logic theorems of the form gamma satisfies phi, where gamma is the theory and phi is the theorem that we prove. We have a paper in ICFP, this is the major conference on uh, functional programming, in which we show how the proof systems underlying these interactive theorem provers can be shallowly embedded in matching logic. That means that they are just notations. They can be desugared mechanically into just matching logic theories and proofs. In other words, we can use not only K, but also COP or ML or, 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 um, or uh, Lean or other interactive theorem provers to generate the proof objects that then can be checked with the proof checker for matching logic. However, we prefer K, first of all, because it's ours, so we have control over it. <laughs> if we need anything, we know where to ask help. But also in K, computation is already proof. Okay, so if you execute a program using the K-generated interpreter, that is directly a proof of the claim that is being uh, produced by that execution, like factorial of three or six. Okay? As opposed to other systems like Coq, where you do a proof and then there is a certain extraction mechanism where you can extract a program from a proof, but only if that is in a certain fragment of Coq that is constructive in a, such a way that you can extract actual programs from, from, uh, from it. So we don't need this uh, extraction mechanism in K. It's just simply we extract the computation directly from the execution. Also, K is very fast. It has been specialized for programming languages. While many of these other provers, Co, Clean, and so on, they are not, uh, they are not uh, specialized for programming languages. They are general purpose uh, provers. And we already have many programming languages formalized in K, like C, and I showed you lots of others, um, Solidity, EVM, and so on. It would be a huge effort to translate all those uh, into other, other provers. Besides that, as I mentioned, we already have um, Co and Lean uh, backends to K actually to matching logic even more generally. So we can take anything in matching logic and deeply embed it into Coq or Lean. So we can use these, uh, uh, these uh, interactive theorem provers to actually derive proofs also in matching logic. In fact, we actually use Coq significantly in our company, uh, probably not as much as K, but almost as much as K. So we are, we are believers in all these interactive theorem provers. The reason we use K again is that it is very intrinsically and directly connected to matching logic. And uh, matching logic allows us to produce very low level proof objects that can be checked with a minimal proof checker. When you implement a proof checker for a logic, there are usually two levels. So first you implement the proof checker in some programming language, and then you compile that programming language into something else in order to execute it. For example, Cox proof checker is implemented in several thousand lines of OCaml, and then OCaml is compiled down to lower level architectures through LLVM or some other uh, uh, compiler infrastructures. In our case, for matching logic, we chose MetaMath. And the reason we chose MetaMath is because it is a very simple language, yet very low level and expressive at the same time. There are more than 20 implementations for MetaMath already um, in C, Rust, Haskell, or Camel, and so on. So what we did was to implement matching logic in MetaMath, or define matching logic in MetaMath as a MetaMath theory. So it looks like in this left column over here, where you see these are axioms, axiom one, axiom two. Then we have a rule here. This is modus ponens, the rule at the bottom. So it's very mathematical. It looks almost like our proof system. Essentially, the proof system I showed on the previous slide that you can write on a napkin, here you can write in 240 lines of metamath in total, including white lines. All right, so we we can also encode claims and proofs of these claims in MetaMath, like we have in the right column here. Right, so this is going to be a very long sequence proving something. 
So we prove a certain property here. Uh, phi implies phi, actually. That is a proof of phi implies phi. But you can similarly prove anything. Anything that K does becomes such a proof, except that you can have millions, billions of steps. Very boring proofs, but very precise, very low level. All right? So basically, now any claim that is made by K or any of the aforementioned uh, systems, in the end, reduces to proof checking in MetaMath. Under this theory, we proof check a certain theorem, and then we have to provide the proof object, which is huge. All right? So that's the idea of MetaMath. And MetaMath has all these 20 plus implementations, all of them very succinct, very small, um, in the order of a few hundred lines of code. Very few of them are larger than a thousand lines of code. The C one has 2,500 lines of code. Okay, so we implemented matching logic in 240 lines of MetaMath, and now MetaMath itself is implementing a few hundred lines of code in lots of different languages. All right, so that gives us the trust base. This is going to be our trust base. We have to trust this implementation of MetaMath and this implement and implementation of MetaMath itself. So very small, very small trust base. Compare that again with thousands of lines of OCaml and then the OCaml compiler okay, that we have in other systems. However, these implementations of MetaMath do not use zero knowledge technology. They are not SNART. So what we've done, we re-implemented MetaMath in a version of Rust or a fragment of Rust that is supported by risk zeros ZKVM infrastructure. All right? And using that, now we can generate by executing the proof checker on the risk zero infrastructure, we can generate now ZK proofs, zero knowledge proofs that these computations took place and the input, the proof object was present. All right? So the claim that the theory, gamma, the programming language, the claim or the theorem that we prove, these are public and actually they should be on the blockchain stored somewhere. And what we do with the proof checker, we have a third argument, the proof object. And now we generate a cryptographic certificate or a cryptographic proof or a ZK proof that the third argument exists and the proof checker when executed on the ZK VM of uh, is zero generates uh, indeed true at the end. This is still work in progress. Um, it's in collaboration with Risk Zero, with Tim Carstens from Risk Zero, and also with my colleague, Andrew Miller, who is also an advisor in our company. And, and it really doesn't have to be Risk um, Zero infrastructure here. We can implement the proof checker also in Solidity and then compile it and check it with CKEVM or in Cairo and then uh, check it using Starknet's infrastructure. Actually, these are experiments in progress and uh, hopefully we'll be able to soon report on them. But the bottom line is that through these two components, the matching logic proof system, and the fact that everything K does generates a matching logic proof, and then through the MetaMath implementation of the matching logic proof system and proof objects, in a language that can be now checked using uh, SNARK technology, we succeeded in completely compressing large proof objects into fixed size certificates, very small, um, fast to check certificates. In the long run, we'd like to actually implement a circuit directly for the matching logic uh, proof uh, checker. We don't need to go through another ZK infrastructure and language. We can manually write a circuit super optimized directly for matching logic. And we'll do that. But first we need to do all these other experiments. This is work in progress, as I said. But once we have that, once we have a super efficient SNART proof checker for matching logic, we can have the same benefits as all these other circuits for uh, specific languages by going to the meta level. So instead of implementing the VM, as a circuit, which is a very hard task, 
taking decades of many men uh, year um, effort. Instead of doing that, we keep the VM as is. Actually, on the contrary, we make it crystal clear. We give it a formal semantics. And then we observe from the meta level its execution. And we just check or we, we, we certify that the execution that we observed is correct, meaning according to the semantics of the programming language and according to the logic, which is unique, one logic, matching logic for all languages and all specifications and all properties. And there is only one SNART artifact, this proof checker, nothing else. So that's our vision. Our approach is more general because it is universal, and yet it yields a smaller circuit than language-specific solutions. Let me elaborate on this a bit. So let's consider ZKEVM as an example. This is just one example, but the same will happen with Cairo, the ZKVM of Risk Zero, ZKLVM of the Neil Foundation. So all of this would suffer from the same problem, right? But I'm just using ZKVM as an example. So the way ZKVM works at a very high level and only for our specific purpose here is that you execute an EVM program. Okay, so you take an execution claim using EVM. Pi, let's say, and then you execute it or get it through the ZK EVM circuit, right? And the ZK EVM then will produce a cryptographic proof of that execution, Pi Phi. All right, so at a very high level, that's how it goes. You have an execution claim, you get it through the ZK EVM, and then you get cryptographic certificate that yes, this execution is correct with respect to what? <laughs> we'll get back to that. But uh, for now, that's how it works. On the other hand, our approach takes any claim, not only an execution claim, any claim. Okay, and our approach, just to remind you, means that we plug the EVM semantics into the K framework, and then you use the ZKification of our proof uh, checker, right, for, uh, for matching logic. So we plug EVM as is, so plug and play the semantics of EVM into the K framework, and with that, we get an executable model of EVM an interpreter, basically, but one which can produce the mathematical proofs of execution. But again, our approach works for any claim. It can be like a security audit. It can be the disk contract is the correct ERC-20 and so on. But now let's just limit ourselves to the input that ZKEVM is also limited to, just a normal execution of a program. So we have such a claim that this program executes and gets this result. And K, instantiated with EVM produces a mathematical proof, this big pi, pi. Mathematical proof, which is long and so on, but it's a mathematical proof of that particular execution. And now this mathematical proof is checked with our proof checker, okay? And then we get a certificate that yes, a mathematical proof for the claim phi has been produced and has been checked and it has been uh, confirmed, so it's true. And we get a correct certificate at the end, pi phi. It may different. It may be different from this pi phi. Actually, any two zk methods will produce different certificates, but they both confirm the same truth that uh, phi is a correct execution. All right. So both approaches get to the same result, but the question is how they do that. So zk EVM implements this very complex circuit. We try to count how large the code base, the trust code base is for that circuit. And after back and forth discussing also with several people from the EVM community, it turns out that it's really anywhere between 30,000 lines of code to 1.5 million, actually more than 1.5 million lines of code, depending really on how you count, right? Would the generator of the circuit also matter? Is it uh, also part of the code base? implementation of the programming languages, because in ZKVM they had to invent two different programming languages only to specify the circuit that they want to generate um, code from. So yeah, so it's not clear exactly how to count, but even in the most optimistic possible uh, um, counting scenario, it still has like 30,000 lines of code. 
30,000 lines of code implementing something very complex. And the claim the ZKVM team makes, and by the way, I have nothing to no, no, nothing with them. I we really like uh, the the Polygon uh, ZKVM team and uh, all the great things they do. This is just a discussion about you know a conceptual discussion about truth here. So the truth is that there is no EVM rigorous specification that they claim their circuit implements. Okay, they just say in words that they try to adhere as much as possible with the yellow paper. The yellow paper is already obsolete, <laughs> that's well known. Um, so the only formal specification of EVM that is complete, that we are aware of, is our KEVM uh, semantics. And uh, I'm not aware of any attempt from their side to use our specification. So the point is that really there is no reference uh, specification of EVM, which is rigorous and validated by the community, that they implemented. So they implemented something that may be some sort of EVM version. And I'm saying version because in the meanwhile, EVM on Ethereum may get upgraded to newer versions, and then there is a gap between the EVM implemented by their circuit and the actual EVM that is on, on Ethereum that they claim they, they are compliant to. So you see my point. My point is that there is it's a very complex code base, it's manually crafted, specific for one VM, one VM, a circuit just for one VM, specifically manually crafted, and there is no rigorous mathematical model of the EVM that they can compare it with. So it's not even clear how they would formally verify. Suppose that they want to formally verify the ZK EVM circuit. How? Against what? Where is the source specification. So, right, well, contrast that to our approach where we just plug and play the EVM formal semantics. Okay, so we take the exact formal semantics that, by the way, should be on the blockchain, currently is not, but it should in the future, and be vetted by the Ethereum Foundation and maybe other uh, organizations. So we take the EVM semantics, plug it into the K framework, and that produces an interpreter which when executes can generate a mathematical proof. Um, and notice that even now I still don't have to trust K. I still don't have to trust K at all with all these you know, gory <laughs> details because the role of K was really only to produce this proof, mathematical proof object. And now I take this proof object and I check it with a proof checker, does not proof checker, which uh, takes as input also the same EVM sem semantic, the same formal specification that is accepted and, 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 and <laughs> it's the reference model of EVM, right? So the proof checker takes it as input, takes the proof object of the claim, uh, pi phi, big capital pi phi uh, of the claim and checks it. And I remind you that this proof checker is ridiculously small. It's just 240 lines of code. Um, and when you combine it into a circuit, yes, it will be a bit um, larger, but um, that's a different uh, measurement now. <laughs> we don't look at the binary, generated binary. We just look at the trust base. The trust base is this 240 lines of code. And um, once it's NARC, then it produces the same cryptographic proof like any, any, any other VM-specific circuit. And notice that you can plug and play any other language instead of EVM. EVM is just an example. And our proof checker knows nothing about EVM, right? Nothing about C, Java, Cairo, RISC, V, LLVM, Plutus, nothing about any of these. These are just formal semantics, which are vetted by their respective committees. And now you plug it into the K framework, you can produce a mathematical proof. And then with the generic proof checker, just one circuit for, to rule them all. That one circuit will check any of the claims for any of these languages. I think um, there is a sharp contrast between our approach and the uh, VM specific approaches. And I believe that ours is cleaner. I hope that now it is clearer why I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that I believe that blockchains of the future will not even have. VMs 
in their validator nodes. VMs are complicated and error prone. And to implement a zero knowledge circuit for an entire VM is a very complex task, which as I showed on the previous slide is unnecessary. So I firmly believe that in the future, we will have formal semantics of languages that we want to use to describe protocols, to describe um, smart contracts, transactions. And, um, and then you can, and those are stored on the blockchain, vetted by their communities. And then uh, you can generate from them directly an execution engine on your local machine. And then you can run your transactions locally, produce the mathematical proofs, and then generate a ZK proof, ZK certificate um, of existence of that mathematical proof. And you present that to the other nodes in the blockchain. And with a light, very lightweight consensus protocol, the entire network can synchronize. And this way you can simply write smart contracts in any programming language for which you have a formal semantics. It's that simple and it works. Next, I'd like to talk about two imminent recurrent revenue products that we are going to launch very soon in this year. One of them is pre-deployment and the other one is post-deployment. The pre-deployment product is K-Prover as a service that we call CAS. So the way CAS works is as follows. So take any of the K tools that we have. For simplicity, let's think of a program verifier, but it doesn't have to be a program verifier. It can be an execution engine as well, or a model checker or symbolic execution. So usually a K tool takes inputs, may take, an obvious input is the programming language semantics, for example, but there could be lots of other um, inputs. So it takes inputs, and based on those inputs, the K tool will do its job, and it will tell us, let's say, true or false, or whatever we ask it to do. Well, one thing we've done in the last year or so was to identify in the K framework those components of the K framework which do the actual proofs, the actual hard work. And we offer those now through an API, right? So you can interact with the K-Prover using an API. For internal use, we isolated and encapsulated that functionality with the API in a server, in a little server or service. And that runs somewhere in the cloud. All right, so now the tool, the K tool, interacts with this K prover, which is very efficiently implemented using all kinds of optimizations and parallelization and all the tricks we know to make it fast. So that runs into the cloud and the K tool interacts with, uh, with uh, that service through an API. So this way, we are not doing it yet, but this way we plan to uh, monetize our K-proving uh, technology. And the vision here is that there will be lots of tools like the program verifier, for example. Let's actually add a bit more um, input to this particular verifier um, tool, right? So the verifier contains its inputs takes his inputs, the programming language semantics, as I mentioned, also the code you want to verify, the properties you want to verify, and the various hints that you may need to help it with as a user. So all these inputs are passed to the program verifier, and the program verifier does a lot of general purpose um, management of all these different uh, uh, data, semantic information, but for the actual proving, it calls the CAS, right? So the plan is that as a company, we are going to offer all these tools to the community. We want to keep um, the K framework open source the way it is and it's been so far. 
but the actual class will have a super optimized implementation and that will run significantly faster than if you want to do everything on your local machine right so as a user you have the option to use the free uh, version of the tool and wait 30 minutes for your uh, proof to be done or you can use our uh, CAS service as a subscriber to the service and uh, you get the result in five seconds instead of uh, five minutes instead of half an hour and um, the way k works is that unlike other program verification tools or formal methods tools which generate a huge uh, z3 or smt formula and which they then they send to the to, to z3 or the constraint solver instead what we do we do lots of work um, in the actual tool driven by the semantics and we only call the server the, the prover um when we cannot discharge the proof obligations locally basically to check the site conditions of the rules mostly we are not encoding in the smt formula the entire semantics of the programming language as other uh, approaches do because we believe that is not the way to go we believe the way to go is to actually run the program symbolically step by step driven by the semantics and then when you need to check some site conditions of semantic rules then you send obligations to, to the server so because of that, actually the SAS, uh, the CAS um, server is, is called like hundreds or thousands of times per user per project, but with very small uh, requests. So we believe this is a perfect model for, uh, for commercialization of our proving technology. A second product that we plan, plan to launch in 2023 is a post-deployment recurrent revenue product specifically an invariant monitoring and recovery product. One of the main outcomes of formal verification audits is that we identify the specifications and invariants they need to hold in order for the protocol to be correct. In our past experience at RV and not only, Identifying the properties that need to be monitored is one of the hardest, the most difficult problems that uh, runtime monitoring projects face. It's simply because these properties do not exist. So you have to work with the uh, clients to identify them. We deployed several runtime monitoring products in the past. RV Monitor was one of them for the embedded systems. Another one was RV ECU for the automotive domain. So you basically have an ECU that monitors what the other ECUs do in your car. So the ECU just plugs into the CAN bus of the car and then it observes that everything goes all right. And in all these instances in the past, the hardest part was to come up with the right properties to monitor. Well, thanks to our audits, we already have those properties. So all we have to do now is to generate efficient monitors that observe the activity on the blockchain and trigger if necessary. We identified two big categories of projects where we can use our uh, monitoring services. One, is without recovery so the monitor only observes and announces clients off chain and the other one is when the monitor also generates or triggers recovery actions the first one without recovery we have already worked with some of our clients to simply monitor the invariants that uh, that um, were audited or that resulted in after after the order uh, resulted from from our audits and whenever those are violated or are close to be violated we can inform them of the health status of their protocol another category of potential clients here could be the keepers who maintain the health of the protocols um, and, and they, they may subscribe to our uh, monitoring services so they can have better opportunities to do their job, to 
liquidate, for example, or to uh, do arbitrage on different protocols. Now, the second category of monitoring services with recovery um, builds upon the observation that many protocols that we audit are correct only under certain runtime assumptions. For example, if you formally verify a lending borrowing protocol, say ABE, you will prove that all the loans will be over collateralized under certain assumptions. And those assumptions are what we monitor. For example, the lending borrowing protocol will be healthy only if liquidations happen. Right? If nobody liquidates those positions which are under collateralized, then uh, the property, the invariant is broken. So, through monitoring, we can observe when the assumptions are violated, and then we trigger recovery to maintain the protocol, the health of the protocol. And this can be offered as a service to our clients uh, who audit their code with us, and we tell them that the protocol is correct under these assumptions. But who guarantees the assumptions? So we can be, we can offer this uh, as a service to our clients to um, to ensure the health of their protocol. But we can go even one step further and be keepers ourselves. And we are in the process of doing that on three different blockchains, on Ethereum, on Algorand, and on Elrond. And uh, we had some successful liquidations already uh, in our team. So, yes, so monitoring is something we want to do also long term in the company. And it can be seen as a complementary service to our pre-deployment uh, security audits. And the main, the key insight that links these two and makes it like a perfect offering is the fact that we identify all the hard part of monitoring during the security audits, namely the specifications and the invariants that need to be monitored. And then once we have those, we can generate monitors and typically these monitors to run most effectively, you have to run them in a node. So we generally launch a node actually, <laughs> an observer node on the blockchain and uh, and uh, there the monitors observe the execution of the of the transactions on the particular protocols that we care about and then this monitor can also trigger actions like arbitrage or liquidations whenever um, violations happen or they are about to happen the two products that i mentioned k okay, is a service cas and runtime monitoring and recovery of protocol invariants leverage our reputation as security auditors with emphasis on formal verification and will provide alternative revenue streams in the company. Until now, most of our revenue came from our services as security auditors or from us developing tools and products for our clients. So with these two products, we hope that we'll uh, start seeing the current revenue coming from products as well, besides our services. So we minimize or reduce the services to only the essential ones. And at the same time, we have revenue coming from these products. And all this, even without zero knowledge through certificates. That will be an entirely new business on top of everything we do already. Let us now discuss how we envision to commercialize our capability to generate uh, proof certificates. We expect to do that in 2024, 2025. Uh, so this year, 2023, we plan to mature our prototypes to um, and then to do more experiments with different uh, languages, different VMs, and uh, then uh, in 2024 to actually launch the following product. 
So first, we call how our K as a service offering works. We have the different uh, K tools in the K toolkit, um, which take input from users, and those interact with the K prover through uh, paid subscriptions um, eventually. And the tool produces an output false, which usually means that the tool was not able to find your, uh, your answer or the answer to your claim. And true, in which case the, the, the tool found uh, a positive answer to your uh, claim in the search space. However, that answer true is based on the belief that K and the cars um, did their job correctly. But remember that K has 500,000 lines of code. So why should you trust that? Or why should you trust that what RV says? The point of proof objects and proof certificates is that you don't have to because, because we can produce these uh, correctness certificates uh, based on the ideas and uh, and the proof checker, the smart proof checker that uh, that we described previously. Therefore, for any claim that a user wants to check uh, with our K technology, we have two opportunities to to monetize. One is the K prover itself in the as a service, and the other one is the production of these proof certificates. Because now the user has the absolute guarantee that their claim phi is correct, is true. Why? Because they can simply check the proof certificate phi phi that we can offer. And we can offer those for a price, which also happens um, with other similar companies. The capability to generate DK proofs for basically any claim made about any programming, any programming language, and not even programming languages. It can be any mathematical fact, any theorem, any mathematical theorem, any fact that is provable. Everything can result in a general knowledge certificate. This is a, an immensely powerful capability. We showed the way to commercialize it by producing proof objects, proof certificates, uh, in addition to the answer that the K uh, tool returns. But that's only scratching the surface. I believe that this will have immense applications in the future. Not only in the context of blockchains, but in the context of truth. We need to know the truth. And in particular, the blockchain of truth will provide an infrastructure for such truths, not only about programs in programming languages, but about any claims anywhere, results produced or searched by complex AI, by machines, by robots, all these can be eventually checked with something we trust, very small and trusted. I believe this will have immense applications in the future. I cannot wait to see how it unfolds. Runtime verification as a company has been around for quite a while by now, 12 years. And during all this time, we developed our own approach and methodology on how to do things. And we really love this methodology. I'd like to say a few words about that. So the three main activities in our company are research, services, and product development. But they are not independent. In fact, the company was formed to bring research done in my lab at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, to the real world. And we continue to do research at the company. And our research looks into the future, as you already saw in the presentation so far. 
we look into the future and we try to reach as much as we can into the future. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our research produces results that can be used in our products eventually. And there is a lot of research that cannot be used <laughs> right away in product. We try to focus on that research that can be used or that has immediate applications to our products. And how we pick these research problems, that's not obvious. Um, it's actually, so the services play a key role here. When we offer services to our clients, we understand their needs. We understand the needs of the tools that we need to offer them as products eventually. And this way, we come up with the right research problems to work on. And those then get incorporated into our products. In general, when we hire, and many of you guys already realize that, when we hire, we look for people with strong background in formal methods, formal verification, functional programming, compilers, because we believe that these people can very or more easily learn the blockchain technology than the other way around. So we don't hire blockchain or Web3 experts. That's not how we look for people because we create these experts. Once you have the background that I mentioned, learning the blockchain aspect is not super difficult, but it takes time. And usually the new hires tend to shadow people who do who offer services in the company, people who do security audits. And this way they will learn what this domain is about. And they will also face the limitations of some of the tools that we use internally or tools that we want to prototype eventually. And after a few audits, you'll have a pretty good idea what they would like to add to the basic infrastructure. And then they switch to developing infrastructure or products. And while doing so, you guys discover new interesting research challenges. And then you communicate that to the research department in RP. By the way, I strongly encourage everybody to go to research.runtiveverification.com to check many of the research initiatives that we're working on. And then once they identify these research problems, sometimes they want to work on those research problems as well. So we give freedom to people in the company to move across the different uh, the different uh, areas that uh, that we work on. I really like this approach, and I'm I'm emphasizing that because sometimes we talk to investors in particular who think that we should minimize the services, we should even eliminate the service, only focus on product revenue producing products. I understand the need for that. I want that as well. But I think that the best way to come up with the best products is actually to do security audits and learn what we need from that and combine it smoothly also with, uh, with research. One metaphor that I like to bring here is, um, is um, like finding a cure for cancer. Well, bugs in code and cancer are not too far away. Well, metaphorically speaking, you cannot hope to find a cure of cancer only if you only focus on product. Okay? You need to do a lot of research, you need to do lots of experiments. Okay? And, and, and then based on that research, you will identify the actual cure and then you come up with the product. It's easy to package it and say, hey, you know, and sell it for a price. The hard problem is to find the right, the right, uh, the right product. And in our case, that cannot be done properly without a lot of research and uh, without offering our services. And also this approach served us well because we were cash positive from day one in the company. Very few companies like ours can, can, uh, can say that. And I'm very proud of that. As you know, before being a professor at the University of Illinois, I was a researcher at NASA in 2000 and 2001. And one thing I learned there, which shocked me when 
uh, I moved there from academia, was that there was so much emphasis on the process and on how to split the resources of a project so that you increase confidence in that project. The bottom line is, was that, which actually shocked me, was that only one fifth, 20% of the budget of a project was allocated to code development. The rest of 80% was all dedicated to verification and validation of the code. And they even had different teams because once I wrote some code, so I was in the 20% for a while, and uh, then the code moved into a VAV stage and it was passed to different teams at NASA and there was a different clearance level. I was not even allowed <laughs> to see my own code once they took it over, a very complex process. But keep, keep this thing in mind, 2080, so 20% for development, 80% VMV. And, and this is a bit shocking um, uh, to, 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 <laughs> to see how in the blockchain, space people think that all the resources should go into writing the smart contracts into writing the code sometimes you don't even write enough tests and then they expect a security audit and a thorough form of verification security audit to be done in the last two weeks before the launch with only five thousand dollars if possible or ten thousand uh, dollars while they spend like two million dollars for for the rest so it's ridiculous uh, i think a lot of uh, education is needed in the, in the blockchain space to truly understand the need for uh, for uh, for uh, strong methodologies and, and and use of the proper use of security uh, auditors but some of our clients understand that and they start working with us very early very early sometimes even before they even write lines of the first line lines, lines of code we develop what we call continuous auditing so we start working with the client from the very beginning and we help them in the process write the code we look over their shoulders and help them write the code in a way that is easier to audit later on so our ideal engagement methodology is as shown on this slide so we'd like to start working with the client and some some of our clients employ this approach especially after working with us for a couple of times they understand the need for such an approach and I'm very proud to say that actually this approach that we develop is more thorough than what we had at NASA. Okay, so we developed this being forced to the need to offer our services in the best possible way. And this is how it goes. So we start with a design consultation. We like to understand the business logic of the protocol. We read their documentation, our client's documentation, written usually in English on a couple of pages, and then we look over the code if they have any, uh, but we can work even without any code. So we together come up with, um, um, with an understanding, a good understanding of the business logic, and we review that as a first step. Then we try to formalize that. And some of our clients are really interested in that. They want to see how the business um, logic um, looks like in a specification model, you know, in a mathematical model. And we can even identify invariants at that stage. And we can even, once we have a model, we can actually prove some properties about the model, even without having any, any code at all. Right? Then the next stage is to develop the code. Our clients write the code, we don't write code for them. We may help them with some tests or with integration with Foundry and so on. So eventually the code is being written. And if we oversee the process, if we look over their shoulders how they write the code, then we can help them write the code in the best possible way for security audits later on. And at that stage, we use also, we could help our clients use all the tools that, uh, that we are that we are that we like like foundry for example and um, and um, write them write help them write many tests and more tests and more tests there is not ever enough tests to try to have full coverage if you can and once we get to that stage we have a good understanding of the code and how it relates to the business logic 
but the code is still not yet formally verified. Now we go to the next step when the code is frozen, more or less, and we take the code and use mechanical tools for verification, like uh, the formal verification that like a foundry, for example, that already does verification. And we can write more properties or write properties directly in K and do formal verification at that, uh, at that level. We use all our tools in our arsenal of tools, the K framework, to get the maximum possible confidence known about the correctness of that code, okay, so do formal verification. And finally, the code gets audited and deployed. We write the usual PDF report. We hope to change it in the future. So we don't write PDF reports. We generate proof certificates. But for now, we write an audit report for our client. The client launches the protocol. And um, normally, the job of a security auditor ends here. But with the monitoring recovery product, now we engage with our clients also post deployment of their contracts. We can monitor the invariants that we verified. You may wonder why monitor them if you verify them, because if you verify them, they are correct. Yes, they are correct under certain assumptions, and those assumptions need to be monitored. Sometimes we monitor the assumptions directly, other times we monitor the actual invariant, um, because that's in the end what really matters, the invariant to hold. Um, and also, monitoring the invariant informs us better of recovery. Right. If the monitor, if the environment is broken, like for example, a loan is under collateralized, then typically we know what to do at that moment, how to fix the problem, right? So liquidate <laughs> in, in that case. So yeah, so this is our our um, ideal engagement methodology. And uh, we prefer clients who understand the need for the entire stack. Um, that we show on these slides. So when we have a choice between a client who wants a quick audit at the end of just before launch because they need the stamp of approval versus a client who starts working with us like six months in advance of launching and understands the need for the entire process, we obviously prefer the, the second client. And hope in the future, as we get more revenue from products, um, from costs and from monitoring to be more and more selective to, to our clients. Pick only those clients who really want the best that we can offer. And the others, we encourage them to use our tools uh, to find the uh, quickly bugs in their code. One last thing I'd like to mention is that we have a huge advantage with the K framework. Because it is language parametric, because you plug and play, plug and play your language. So this capability of K, which was there from the beginning before blockchain was even a word, we were able to adapt our tools to work with multiple blockchains and multiple languages and to do audits across all these blockchains that I mentioned here and um, to give semantics to languages supported by many of these languages, uh, blockchains. Languages to the right are the languages um, that, that we use in our, in our audits, uh, which uh, we gave semantics to, some of them, most of them, or others, um, we just do our audits based on them, because our mentality <laughs> is multi-language and, 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 and multi-blockchain. And we should not take this for granted. Uh, we are probably the only security auditing company that can handle so many different uh, blockchains. Our core technology, the K framework. So I'm very proud of what we've achieved so far and the fact that we can truly be multi-chain and multi-language. And with this, thank you for your patience to listen to all this long presentation. And feel free to contact me. Here is my information. You'll find me on the internet. Contact me, ask me any questions, internet, Slack, anywhere. Thank you so much. And I believe that our vision moved you a little bit. I believe that 
that it is now clearer how everything we've done in this company, and not only in the last 20 years or so, everything converges to this idea, this vision that we can have succinct correctness certificates for claims that are being made. All the hard work we put in the K infrastructure, in the K prover, in instrumenting the various components to generate proof objects, all the foundational work that we've done on matching logic, papers we published, nothing, nothing was a side project. Everything converged on this pyramid or causality cone, if you want, that everything was done to cause finally this main major revolutionary, I would say, idea that everything we do can be signed with a check mark if it is correct. The truth is the truth, cannot be changed. And now we can certify the truth. And there is no better truth than a mathematical statement, mathematical theorem. And everything we do in computing, from execution of programs to model checking of programs, to formal verification of programs, everything reduces to mathematical theorem, which once it has a proof, it becomes a truth. Thank you.